Hey guys, welcome to Telling the Told and Untold. My name is Tsuho. straight into today's case I do have a content warning for you guys in this video we do talk about children and this case is a bit heavy so if that's not something you think you're interested in watching then this video probably isn't for you so maybe you can watch some of my other videos or just wait for my next upload in 2019, Sibusiso and Khulisi Limpungosi had been married for 11 years and they lived in the Y Bank area in KwaZulu Natal, which is about a 30 minute drive to Durban. And altogether, they had four children. Kholisile had a daughter from a previous relationship, and at the time of today's case, she was 16 years old, and her name is Ayaka Giani. And together, they had three children. Kutleko Nke, who was four years old, Kwezi, who was six, and Sipesile, who was 10 years old. The Mpungozi family seemed like they had a normal, loving family life. Kholisile's family would later go on to say that Sibusiso was very quiet, he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, and every time they'd have like family events, he really didn't say much, he'd spend a lot of the time with the children, and they just really thought that he was a good fit for Kholisile, and they didn't see any red flags. It's also said that he was a very good father, and he would spend so much time with his children, and the neighbors would say that they would see him outside playing with them and even though Ayaka was not his biological child he would still like treat her the same and everything just seemed all well with the family. Oli Sile was said to be a very loving and dedicated mother. She loved her children so much. She loved her family. She was also a teacher and she had recently been promoted. And by all means, the Mpungosi family seemed like a happy family, like nothing seemed out of the ordinary for them, but things were different behind doors. It said that Sibusiso was extremely abusive, he was jealous of Kholisile's accomplishments in her career, and she just didn't see the marriage continuing. So sometime in August or early September, she had sent divorce papers to Sibusiso. On Tuesday the 3rd of September 2019, the day started like it usually did. Everybody would wake up and then Polisile will take the three younger kids with her and she would drop them off at school and then she would go to the school where she works. Ayaka would be picked up from home. It was like school transport that picks up people from their houses and then drops them off at school and she attended at Pine, Tine, Pine Town Girls High School. So she she would get picked up by a transport and then Sibusiso would be the last person to leave the house. What was a bit different about this day is that Sibusiso was not supposed to be in the house. It said that he was supposed to move out I think a couple of days earlier but he kept postponing the day and on this Tuesday he had told Chloe Sile that when she comes home he would have moved out already. Different sources say different things about what happened next but it said that Lolisile dropped the kids off at school and then she went to the police station and she told the officers that she had gotten into an argument with her husband the night before and she just had a bad feeling and felt like something was going to happen so she just wanted police officers to know. She then went to work and at the end of her work day she went to a hardware store so that she could buy padlocks so that if CBC's returned home after work he wouldn't be able to enter the house because she would have locked it. It said that while she was in the store she then received a phone call from the principal of the school that her children attended and the principal was just letting her know that CBC so had picked up the kids and the reason why they let her know is because the kids would usually go home with like a school transport and none of the like 
CBC so old Khalisi Le wouldn't pick them up from school so it was a bit odd so that's why they had called her and after this she immediately went to the police station and told them that she had been there earlier that morning and told them that CBC so had picked up the kids and she didn't know what was happening and just had a bad feeling and then after this the police said that they would accompany her home and as they were on their way home she then called one of her neighbors and asked her neighbor if the children had returned home and the neighbor said that she saw them coming home and they went into the house closed the door and then she just heard loud music she then went to go check the gate and the gate was locked and she wasn't able to get inside and then the police and police relay arrived and this was around 3 p.m or just after 3 p.m other sources say that whilst police relay was at work she got email notifications from Taxify, which is like an e-hailing service, and she saw that CBC so had went to the children's schools and then had taxified home. And she thought that was very strange because the kids were still supposed to be in school. It was still school hours. And she knew that once she got home, the kids would also get home. Like they got home around the same time, usually with like a five minute difference. So the fact that she was still home and he had picked them up and had taken them home was very strange. She then excused herself from work and went straight to the police station and told them what her husband had done and just the circumstances and everything that had been happening in the home. And the police officer said that they would accompany her to her house. And they got there at around 2.30 and police officers tried opening the door, but it was like they couldn't open it. And it turned out that CBC so had changed the locks in the entire house. So police officers and and police Lee couldn't get inside and this is when they broke down the door and they came across a scene that they'll never forget. They found four-year-old Kutle Koenke, six-year-old Kwezi and ten-year-old Spesite hanging with robes and it was clear that Sibusiso had murdered them. Police then searched the entire house, but they couldn't find Ayake, and this is when they started posting flyers about her being missing and CBC Sou's possible involvement. It's also said around this time, CBC Sou had called one of Tolisi Le's cousins who lived in Johannesburg and told her that he had left Ayake in a park in New Germany, which is around the area. And after this, she called family members who were in KwaZulu Natal and were able to go to the park and it said that these family members got to the park and they started screaming Ayake's name and they were looking around and they didn't hear anything there was no one responding and as they were about to leave they saw a school blazer on the floor and it was the same school blazer that IIK had and then they looked further up and they saw her school bag and next to the school bag they saw IIK lying face down and she had a pink belt that was hanging from her neck and she had blood in her mouth. However, police officers who were investigating this case say that once they searched the house and they couldn't find IIK, they then tried to get a hold of the taxi fire driver that had picked up IIK and CBC saw from her high school and tried to find out where he had dropped the pair off. And once they got to this location, they started searching this park in the bush area and then they found her hanging on one of the trees. But what we do know is that she was found in a park in New Germany and just like her three younger siblings, she had also been killed by Sibusis. Police officers then received information that Sibusiso was somewhere around Guadabeke and because they had been contacting his friends and family and trying to get information about him, one of his friends went to the police officers and told them that he was in contact with Sibusiso. And because of this, police officers decided to just have him tag along because they thought it would be a great idea to have someone who would be able to identify Sibusiso instead of them like having to maybe bring him in and get that confirmation a while later so he was just going to walk around with them 
and then after this they got into the police van and they went all the way to Guadebeca to the police station and once they got out they were kind of facing a bridge it's called the Dumisani Makaya bridge and immediately Sibusiso's friend saw him and pointed towards him and told police officers there he is. It turned out that Sibusiso was on the bridge because he was about to jump and take his own life but after he saw the police van he decided against it and then he just bolted and ran away from police officers into the areas into the houses in that area. The police officers then managed to cordon off a big part of the area in Guadebeca so they covered some of the highway as well as the area of houses where they saw CBC so run towards and this kind of like cornered him because he wouldn't be able to escape and get somewhere else because in like every corner that he would turn to try and leave that township he Police officers were everywhere trying to find him. Police officers then searched throughout the night trying to find him. Police officers were located in different areas of the place where they had cordoned off. So Sibusiso's friend was still with him at this time and he was traveling with one of the police officers and they were driving down the road, it was very quiet and then the police officer saw something in the corner of his eye and then he stopped the car. He then got out of the car as well as Sibusiso's friend and they were kind of just like looking around trying to see what he might have seen. And as he looked down, he saw that in the area that they were in, there was only one house that was down the street. So if someone had been there, like what he saw in the corner of the eye was a person, they the only option they had was to go directly to that house. So the officer decided that they were going to go to that house. So he drew his weapon and he walked towards the house. They had like two stairs. He climbed on the stairs to the main door and on the side of the house someone kind of came out and jumped in front of him as well as Sibusiso's friend and immediately Sibusiso's friend like pointed towards him and he was like that's him and then he kind of like came to and realized what was happening and he saw that Sibusiso had a brick in his hand and then Sibusiso's friend decided that he was going to run towards the car so he kind of just left the police officer there and then Sibusiso kind of looked at the police officer the police officer took a step back and he was kind of deciding whether he was going to shoot or not shoot and then Sibusiso looked towards him looked at the friend kind of seeing like he was like deciding his options and deciding what he was going to do and then he just decided that he was going to flee again. So then he ran past that house and back into the area where he was in and then this officer called the other police officers and told them that he had spotted CBC so but he managed to flee again. And police officers then kind of had an idea of where they should start searching or like move their search towards and they searched again throughout the entire night into the morning and they still hadn't found CBCs. So now that the sun was out, police officers decided that they were going to separate. So some police officers stayed in Guadabega so they could look for CBC. So while other officers went back to the police station so that they could interview more people and just get more statements about CBC saw and everything like that. Police officers then got a phone call that CBC so had been spotted in the Kranzluf Nature Reserve and this nature reserve bordered Guadebeca so it was very possible that CBC so had managed to pass police officers and go towards that nature reserve. So police officers took a dog unit and they started searching this area. It's like a big valley and it's quite big. And as they were searching, looking for Sibusiso, they then received another phone call that Sibusiso had been spotted in a tavern in Guadabega. So then that group decided to split up and some stayed in the nature reserve and others went to this tavern. And the reason why the other officers stayed 
Wade in the Nature Reserve is because they spotted someone and when they tried to flag this person down, this person decided to run away from them. So they thought it was a high possibility that it might be CBC. So, so then the other officers went to the tavern and they saw this person and this person was extremely intoxicated and everyone in that tavern was convinced that it was CBC. So they then took this person to the police station and once he got to the police station they identified him as Sibusiso Mpungosi and then the other pursuit in the nature reserve was then called off. Sibusiso was extremely drunk so much so that he couldn't talk so police officers decided that they were going to wait for him to sober up before they asked him any questions and they then they just read him his rights and then they took the clothes that he was wearing as evidence and gave him PPE to wear. They then called an expert to come in and swab underneath his nails and also take photos of his body because he had scratches everywhere. He would later say that he got those scratches from when police officers apprehended him and police officers were like that's literally not possible because those scratches looked like he had been in a fight or maybe someone had been fighting for their life. Sibusiso was able to call his family and he spoke to them for a bit and then he decided that he was going to tell police officers everything that had happened literally the day before. Sibusiso says that the 3rd of September started like it usually did. Polisile and the children would wake up and then she would leave with the three younger children and then Ayake would wait for her school transport to come and then she would go to school and then he would be the last person to leave the house. But on this particular day he didn't leave when he was supposed to but when he eventually woke up he decided to go to the hardware store. When he got to the store he bought new locks and changed all the locks in the house and then from there he requested a taxify and he taxified to the three younger children's school and he picked them up and then he brought them home and once they got home he sent 10 year old Siposite to the store. Once the 10 year old had left he then decided that this was the time to strike. There he tied four year old Kutle Koenke with a rope and taped his mouth then he proceeded to do the same thing with six-year-old Quesley. When Siposita then returned from the store he did the same thing to him. He then took the robes from the gowns and he hung the children in different rooms. One of the rooms being the main bedroom that he slept in with Lulisil. After his three biological children were dead, he then got another taxify and taxified to Pine Town, Pine Town Girls High School so that he could pick up Ayake and it said that Ayake was so scared she didn't want to go with CBC so when she saw him and she was literally hiding from him and she told her friend that if CBC so sees her and manages to like go home with her that her friend should immediately call her mother and let her know what was happening and as she was trying to hide she could see CBC so looking by the school halls looking at all the learners and eventually he spotted her and he just said I I care let's go they then got into the taxify and the taxify drove down until they got off at some bushes in New Germany outside of Pine Town and he had told IIK that they were going to pick up her mother from school where she worked. So once they got out of the taxify and they were walking through the bushes, Sibusiso knew that what he had done to the three younger children wouldn't work on IIK because she was much older and she was much stronger than the three kids. He then took her by the hand and pulled her into the bushes and he decided to strangle her on the spot. It said that Ayake tried to fight by all means. She was kicking, she was screaming, she was pushing and she fought for her life. But unfortunately, Sibusiso was much stronger and he got the upper hand and then he straddled, he straddled her and 
strangled her until she took her last breath. He then left her there and went to go drink. On the 6th of September, so just three days after CBC so had killed his four children, he made his first appearance at the Pine Town Magistrates Court and then the matter was moved to the Peter Maritzburg High Court. During the court proceedings, Subisi so was very quiet, he wouldn't look directly at the judge, he just looked down and he was very stoic and it was just a very odd scene to watch because this man had killed four of his children but in front of the judge he was acting almost like childlike, you know, like he, I don't know, it was just very weird. CBC so would tell his attorney that the reason why he killed the four kids is because there was this one day when one of the children were playing with their mother's phone and he just happened to look at the phone and then he saw a picture of Ayaka and her biological father and he thought it was a bit strange so he asked Kholisile why she had a picture of Ayaka and her biological father on her phone and she simply told him that Ayaka had went to go visit her father during the school holidays so she just took the picture and then after this CBC so said that he got very suspicious of her and then there was another day when the child was playing with Kholisile's phone again and he didn't want them breaking the phone or anything so he kind of just grabbed the phone and then he says he somehow stumbled into whatsapp and he saw that Lolisile was speaking to Ayaka's biological father on whatsapp and he then said he went through the messages and he was very confused about why they had been speaking and this just made him even more suspicious and he became convinced that Rolisile was having an affair with Ayaka's biological father and one of the main reasons why he thought this is because he saw like kiss like kissing emojis and heart emojis so then he asked Rolisile about this and she just told him that Ayaka used her phone to talk to her biological father and it wasn't anything like that. He then went on to say that he saw something that confirmed his suspicions about Rolisile having an affair but he wouldn't say what he saw and what this confirmation was. He says that after this the two of them kind of drifted apart and they started sleeping in separate beds and their marriage was very rocky but he thought that maybe they'd come out of it but then she decided to send divorce papers and this kind of just completely like you're just completely taken aback because he knew things were bad in their relationship but he didn't think they were divorce kind of bad. He says that after this he was extremely depressed, he didn't know what to do with himself, he had a complete breakdown and the only way to deal with all of these emotions was to murder the four children. Sibu Siso decided to plead guilty to four counts of murder and then two months later in November 2019 he was sentenced to four life imprisonments for the murders of 16 year old Aya Kajiani, Kule Koenke who is four years old, six year old Kwezi and ten year old Sipesik. Ayaka had high hopes and aspirations for her life. She was down to earth, she was said to be very kind hearted and had a bright future ahead of her. She had a generous smile to match her generous spirit and even though she was only in grade 11, she had already secured a scholarship from one of the companies to study either accounting or medicine at the university of her choice. Kutle Konke, Kwezi and Sipusitle were so young and they still had so much life to give and they'd never get the opportunity to decide what they want to do with their lives, what they want to become 
and just grow into the people that they were meant to be. In Rolisile's impact statement, she said, I cannot face other children without thinking about my children. The most painful fact is that they are gone and will never come back to me. I'll never be able to talk to them, touch them, or hear their voices ever again. And my plans for them are gone with them. I see no reason for getting up in the morning. I'm in a situation that seems to have no end. And that's it for today's case. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. I know this one was a bit heavy. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. It helps out my channel a lot. And yeah, I'll see you guys next time. Bye.